Previously, we discussed restriction enzymes and we said we can use these restriction enzymes to cut our DNA molecule into smaller fragments known as restriction fragments. Now, once we have these DNA restriction fragments, we can basically study these fragments, we can analyze them, we can manipulate them, we can amplify them, make many copies, and we can do all sorts of different things with these DNA fragments. Now, let's suppose we take the DNA molecule, we expose it to our restriction enzymes, and we create these many DNA fragments. And let's say that one of these fragments contains a specific gene that we want to study. The question is, how do we, I, how do we identify that specific fragment that is carrying the gene, and how do we isolate and separate that fragment to basically study it further? Well, we have to carry out a process known as southern blotting. In southern blotting, we essentially use gel electrophoresis, as we'll see in just a moment, to basically identify and isolate a specific DNA fragment of interest. So let's begin with step number one. So we take our double-stranded DNA molecule that contains the gene that we want to study. Now, we know what the sequence of nucleotides within that gene is before we actually carry out that process. And we'll see why that's important in step three. So we take the DNA, the double-stranded DNA molecule, we expose it to specific restriction enzymes so that when they cleave that DNA molecule, one of these fragments will carry that gene of interest. So let's suppose we break it down into five different fragments and these fragments differ in their size. So we have the largest fragment, fragment A, we have the smallest fragment, fragment E, and the fragment in between these fragments in terms of their size is fragment C, and that's the fragment, let's say, that contains the gene that we want to actually study. So fragment C is that DNA fragment, that restriction fragment that we actually want to identify and then separate. So let's move on to step two. So we take these fragments, we essentially place them into a solution that denatures the double helix structure. And so now in our solution, we have these single-stranded individual DNA molecules. And now we take them and place them into a gel electrophoresis setup. Now, if the DNA molecule isn't too large, we can use the polyacrylamide gel, but if the DNA molecule is very large, then we have to use a gel that has larger pore size, so we normally use agarose gel. So these are the two gels that we can basically use, and the one that we use determines, or uh, which one we use is determined by the size of that initial DNA molecule. Now, so we take our fragments and we place them into the gel electrophoresis setup and now the gel electrophoresis basically separates the DNA fragments based on size. So the largest fragments, fragment A, will be all the way at the top because it will experience the greatest resistance. While the smallest fragment, fragment E, will be found all the way at the bottom because it does not experience a large resistive force. And once we separate the five fragments based on size, we can then basically transfer that result onto a special polymer sheet that we can use more effectively. And usually we use the nitrocellulose polymer sheet. Now, once again, it's important to know that within these regions, these are no longer in their double-stranded form. They exist as single-stranded DNA molecules, and that leads us directly into step three. So in step two, we essentially separated these fragments based on size. The next question is, how do we identify which one of these bands contains that gene of interest? So remember, in the beginning I said that we have to know what that sequence of nucleotides is in that gene that we want to isolate. And so what we do in step three is we build 
a DNA molecule, a DNA probe that contains a complementary nucleotide sequence that is complementary to that DNA fragment, the gene that we want to isolate found in fragment C. And when we built it, we, uh, when we build it, we radioactively label that DNA probe. For example, we use radioactively heavy phosphorus atoms. And what that will allow us to do is in step four, we're going to be able to use x-ray autoradiography to basically find exactly where that DNA molecule is. So in step three, a specific restriction fragment of interest, so this C, can be detected by creating and adding a radioactively labeled complementary DNA strand to that polymer sheet. Since it is complementary to the gene of interest, it will hybridize with the fragment of interest. So it will basically form a double-stranded form, a double-stranded uh, helix. So to see exactly what we mean, let's take a look at the following diagram. So in this diagram, it is before we added that DNA probe. And so if we zoom in on this band, band C, we basically get this double-stranded DNA molecule has been denatured. And so these two individual single strands exist as single strands. Now, when we add that DNA probe that has been radioactively labeled by, let's say, a heavy phosphorus atom, so what will happen is, because the sequence is complementary to this sequence here, the green radioactively labeled DNA probe will hybridize, will form a double helix structure with that single-stranded complementary molecule. And so now, this has been radioactively labeled. And notice this DNA probe will not form the same double helix with any of these other bands because the other bands don't have that complementary sequence. So this molecule is the single stranded DNA fragment of interest that we want to actually detect. And the green molecule is that radioactively labeled DNA probe that contains a nucleotide sequence that is complementary to that restriction fragment above that we essentially want to detect. And once we carry out step three, then we can use the process of order radiography and that will allow us to pinpoint exactly where that fragment is. And now we know if we go back to this setup that this band C contains those fragments that we want to isolate. And so we can take out the fragments, remove the other unwanted fragments, and now we have a pure solution that contains only the fragment, only that gene that we were actually interested in the first place. So this process by which we can actually pinpoint, detect, and then isolate that DNA fragment of interest by using our DNA probe is known as southern blotting. But we also can repeat the same exact process with RNA molecules. So if we have an RNA molecule that we actually want to isolate, we can use an RNA probe, a radioactively RNA probe, in the same exact process. But if we're dealing with RNA, the process is known as northern blotting. So in the same analogous way, we can conduct the same steps to separate and locate RNA fragments. But instead of using the DNA probe, we use a radioactively labeled RNA probe. And this process is known as northern blotting. So in southern blotting, we essentially pinpoint, we detect and separate DNA fragments in northern blotting, we detect and separate RNA fragments. And in western blotting, we basically detect and isolate our protein fragments, as we discussed in our lecture on purifying proteins via western blotting process.